Um, I uh, work at the Center for Integrated Ag Systems. We've been around almost 30 years also. And um, our primary purpose is to take what we hear from farmers that, uh, for research needs and then turn it into research that's useful to them. So I'm gonna share with you some of our thoughts about um, uh, sustainable agriculture and local foods and scaling up. Um, I think, oh, let's see. There we go. Um, so I think all of you are familiar with this kind of a diagram describing uh, sustainable agriculture. We've also talked about it as a three-legged stool. Um, but I want to, uh, I had a chance to hear John Eichert speak a couple months ago at the Wisconsin Farmers Union Convention. And while I was speaking, I kind of had an epiphany. What if you take this, looking at it from this point of view, and then move it this way and look at it? And what you see is an emergence. That sustainability is something that emerges, that um, all our wealth comes from the land, and then from that, we develop social systems that make it possible to um, have good lives, and then from that, we get an economic system that works, right? So it's not that they're all equal, um, it's that they emerge from one another. So I think what happens a lot is that we forget, oops, shoot, we forget about this socially acceptable part and we think we can just do this economically viable and environmentally sound piece of it. But really, um, the economics emerges from the social order that's created when we farm the land in an appropriate way. So here's another way of looking at it. How many people have seen this? A couple people? Good, excellent. So um, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands throughout this piece. So the idea of this, we were trying to understand how does this local food thing fit in, how does, how does um, uh, scaling up fit into all of this? And what we started out with was tier zero, which is the personal production of food. How many people engage in this? How many, actu how many people actually grow food? Backyard, container garden on your deck, anything. Little radish seeds in kindergarten. Um, so this is where you get your values. This is where you really connect with the earth and you really understand um, why it matters if it rains every three days or what um, a frost looks like or um, have that experience of going out to the garden and going, I'm not gonna pick any more of these green beans. I've been picking green beans for weeks. I'm done with green beans. I'm gonna let them go back into the earth, compost, and we'll start with green beans next year. So um, after tier zero, where you've got that really intimate connection with food, you go to tier one right here. And this is where you might not actually grow your own food, but you, are, you know the people who do grow it. You go to farmer's market, you meet people face to face, you get a sense of what their lives are like and how your life and their life are intertwined. And it used to be that there was a lot more of that in the very olden days, like my grandparents' days. Um, it kind of fell out of favor and we've been reviving that. I think a lot of what the sustainable ag movement has done is make it possible for people to have that connection with farmers again. That's been really important. Um, then we go to strategic partnerships, this tier two. And this is where um, you've got supply chains, so you're starting to work in the wholesale arena, and um, uh, you preserve some of the story of the food, so that as a consumer, if you go buy Organic Valley milk, I can say, I know farmers that supply Organic Valley, and I'm going to buy that milk over a store-branded organic um, choice, because I know those farmers. So it's, uh, there is still transparency in the relationships, but it's not quite uh, the same as actually going to someone's farm and buying the milk or going to farmer's market and buying cheese. Then the next one is tier three. This is large volume aggregation and distribution. This is where you get into really big wholesale. And a lot of us have been trying to figure out how do we get into this big wholesale, how do we get into the wholesale game? You know, how do we get to um, selling in to Kroger stores, or how do we, because that's the only store in our town, right? That's our main supermarket. It's the main supermarket for many people in the country now. Um, how do we get into Cisco so that our school can buy um, local food? Well, it's really difficult to get into these larger chains just because of the size of the, just the volume. Um, and then you go to global anonymous aggregation and distribution. And here you've got um, companies taking 
say soybeans for instance, and, and splitting them into many different ingredients that then are used in creating a number of different products. So this whole, this whole piece, um, uh, it really has to do with um, not just scale, but transparency. So if you're doing global anonymous aggregation and distribution, if you take away the anonymous piece of it, it kind of gets down into maybe tier three, maybe tier two. Um, and I've got a couple examples of that um, I'll talk about later. Does everybody, anybody have any questions specifically on this? Because this is really key to understanding well, where we're going with this. Okay. Oh, yep, go ahead. Yeah, there was a whole group of us that sat around together and we're talking about how do, we, how do we discuss this stuff? Because, you know, urban agriculture tends to spend a lot of time on this personal production of food and maybe get into the direct producer to consumer, sometimes strategic partnerships, selling into a co-op or a restaurant. But that's pretty much where most of that is, is um, centered. Um, it might not make sense for somebody to go beyond a direct marketing uh, approach to uh, farming, and there's no reason you have to go beyond that for farmers out there. If that's where you're comfortable, that's what you want to do, that's great. However, if you want to get into strategic partnerships uh, with others who uh, hold your values about sustainable agriculture, then we're starting to talk about developing wholesale supply chains. How do we do that? Do you have a, is there a marketplace? access to a market where you can actually enter it, or are you looking at these gigantic supply chains that you can't get in? So, scaling up and profitability. Um, later today, um, uh, Rebecca Jablonski and uh, Keiko Tanaka are talking at um, 1 p.m. track B, um, and they can tell you more about this, but this is part of their research. So. What they came up with was that if you are a farmer making less than $75,000 in sales, you have an off-farm job. There is no way you can have a life with that few sales. Um, and by have a life, I mean like own your farm, send your kid to college, maybe buy a truck when the old one breaks, that basic kind of livelihood. Now, um, if you don't need all that stuff, that's fine, you can do that. Or you can have your off-farm job that supports you. Or, the, or you have capital coming from somewhere else, a prior job or an investor or something like that. So if you are a farmer with sales between, where's my pointer? Sales between 350K to 1 million, you're starting to see some positive returns. You're more likely to succeed. That already is at, this, at a wholesale scale. And um, a 42% ROA is pretty darn good. I don't know a whole lot about ROA, probably other people do, but somebody told me that, a, that in real estate, a 20% ROA is, is amazing. So people are making really good return on their investment or their assets. And then if you can sell, if you're selling over a million, then you're almost for sure to be profitable. You can really, you know, you're much more likely to succeed. So over a million, I know um, a number of CSAs in my um, community that are making over a million by selling farmer's market, three to 500 boxes of CSA at least, um, and then um, selling wholesale. Now when is too big, when is it too big? That's what we don't understand so well. So. Some of the barriers to scaling up, to getting into that wholesale sector, to, do, to be able to play in that area, are transportation and labor. This stuff came out of discussions with a lot of farmers. We've been working on this since 2008, 2009, and these are the key areas. So, you know, I just, I sort of go into the swamp and figure it out. <laughs> so I started going to a lot of transportation conferences and um, started trying to learn the language of transportation. What are these people trying to do? Uh, what are the stories they tell each other? What are the narratives they talk about? So one of the things they talk a lot about is efficiency. Efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. It's all about fuel efficiency and labor efficiency and how do we you know, make good use of our vehicles so that they're always on the road and not sitting unused or only traveling half full. And so they're all about efficiency. What do we hear when we go to a sustainable ag conference? We hear diversity. We hear how, much, how do we um, 
make our farms more diverse and more stable um, ecologically. So these two competing narratives are out there about efficiency and diversity. And um, what um, uh, Sally Gurner, who's a researcher um, out east, um, talks a lot about is um, how do we find an optimal area where both efficiency and diversity are optimized? What does that look like? And we're starting to kind of see examples of that, but not a lot. Some, but not a lot. So, I'm gonna drop down to the next level of detail here. I've been talking very big picture, abstract. So I wanna talk a little bit about food flow. Um, often when we're talking about scaling up, we're talking about infrastructure. And I think if we switch our mindset just a little bit to think about food flow, how do we make food move from where it's grown to where it needs to be eaten? You know, we see a lot of problems with food flow and, and food access issues, both in urban and rural areas. That's, a, that's an issue of flow, not necessarily of, of um, uh, not simply of uh, infrastructure. So this map is a USDA map um, that shows um, the fruitful rim are all these kind of yellowish, greenish pews. <laughs> states, and that's where most of our fruit, fruit and vegetables are grown today. That didn't used to be the case, but that is what it is now. So all, all these areas are trucking food into cities around the United States. The Northern Crescent has a long history of supplying large cities in the northern parts of the United States with food, but a lot of the infrastructure has decayed over time. Um, as the national supply chains have developed with refrigeration, transportation changes, um, all, uh, uh, water um, availability in desert regions. So basically, we've got potential throughout this whole area. We've actually got some remaining infrastructure in this Northern Crescent area that isn't, doesn't exist in some of the other parts of, this, of the country. And so we've got, um, um, the food flow is different up here than it is for the fruitful rim states in terms of packing houses, processing facilities, all that kind of stuff. Now, this is a map predicting where people are gonna live in 2050. And you can see we've got huge urbanization issues. This is happening all over the world. This is not just the United States. This is a, this is a trend of people moving from rural to urban. It's global. And you can see that this is where I live, right in the middle of that yellow area that's still not urbanized. And that's all the people that are expected to flock to the Great Lakes and the wonderful water source that we have in the Great Lakes. The Northeast is still rather big. Florida, is anybody else skeptical about that? I mean, <laughs> I just, you know, I don't know if we're gonna have a peninsula there in 2050. Maybe it'll be um, 2100 before the peninsula is gone, I don't know. But the, um, you know, we've got Northern California, Southern California, and Arizona area. I don't know what's gonna go on with desertification if that, and water access, if that's still gonna be there either. But anyway, so, um, how do we get food here, and uh, what's the distance to market? So right now we're getting this Northern California, I mean this California Valley area is sending a ton of food across the country, and it's um, huge warehouses right here in, in, um, in the Chicago land area, and then the, then food continues on to the Northeast and and into the South, and then there's some food also coming up. You know, citrus for instance is really big coming out of Florida and going up. So what that food flow looks like is really specific to the region that you live in, and it's gonna, it's gonna vary. What we get, just to put it out there, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, so what we get is a food comes across, goes to Chicago, and then it goes in a truck up to Milwaukee, and then over to Madison, and then to the Twin Cities. And so by the time the Twin Cities gets it, it's a pretty um, empty truck. There's not, um, they, they, are getting, uh, they aren't getting the first pick off that truck, right? And so we've got a really strong local food system because we still have places to grow food and we have um, a low level of access to food in that overall flow. So everybody's flow is different. I don't know where you all are from, but you, know, you are probably facing a different set of constraints on that. Oops. 
So, this is out of an FAO report um, looking at food distribution issues globally. And basically they're saying that as the population is urbanized, the food system is not organized sufficiently to be able to meet, meet our needs, whether they're urban or rural needs. So one of the things we look at in, in a very detailed way are critical thresholds, like what do you need to be able to make it into the system, into the food system, the pipeline of food flow. And one of the big problems that we've got in local food is this issue of um, um, how many, the, sh the, the transportation segments. So we've got first mile, where the farmer takes the product to a loading dock. Uh, might be a packing house, it might be a, a a processor, like a, uh, well, any kind of a processor, and m they might be aggregating food together, like you and some neighbor farmers might get together and put food together on a truck. Then that truck, as the farmer, you become the shipper, you pay for that truck, that food to move to this point. This could be a distribution center, which is privately owned, like Kroger's distribution center or Cisco's distribution distribution center, or it could be a terminal market, which um, there are some terminal markets left in the United States, um, and at the terminal market, that tends to be a public market where um, you're able to sell product to a buyer. What happens is that if you, don't, if you aren't able to go through a distribution center, you're too small, for instance, you don't have a big enough load, and there's no terminal market, you're driving this distance from C to D to the retail outlets. So you're selling directly to grocery stores and restaurants and stuff like that, and you're covering all the transportation costs through the whole supply chain. In this model, the distribution center or the terminal market can put a markup on that product and then sell it to the retail outlet. So the retail outlet is basically paying for that transportation cost. So a lot of times um, for a farmer, it's very inefficient and it costs you a lot more money to take it the whole way rather than selling it to a distribution center or a terminal market. Um, if this distance between A and D is 50 miles or less approximately, you can probably do that all right. But if you're traveling two hours or 400 miles to get to a market, you are paying through the nose to get your food <laughs> into an established market. So, farmers have to make money. This is the same stuff that was on the other slide. So, you're looking at, you want to be able to drop all your product for a wholesale market within 200 miles of where you grow it, or where you put it on the truck. You want enough production to fill a 53-foot truck. That's the most efficient movement of that food to market. You need enough diversity on your farm for healthy soil, but you need enough efficiency on your farm um, to streamline farm labor. One of the things we kept hearing from CSA growers is like, I am so tired of growing 60 different vegetables. It's too complicated. It's like, it takes a lot of very um, careful management to pull that off. I'd rather grow 10 crops and get money for those crops. I know I can grow beets, I can grow carrots, I can grow, um, uh, uh, what were some of the other money makers? Those are the two, the two that I remember the most. Um, but uh, I'd rather grow those for a wholesale crop and keep my labor um, management in, in, uh, contained so I can actually make some money farming. And there's probably other things too, other thresholds that we haven't, haven't investigated yet. The other thing in the supply chain is that the truckers and the wholesale buyers also must make money. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the horrible situation going on in trucking right now, but there's 100% turnover in, um, in labor for drivers. Um, there are, are trucking companies going out of business. Just like in farming where we're aging out and it's very hard to find young farmers, there are very few young truckers coming in. Um, many of the trucking companies are buying up, other, they're consolidating just like has happened in uh, farming. So we're losing our capacity in trucking as well. So what truckers are looking for to make a living, they want regular hauling and buying contracts. So they don't want you calling up a week before you've got a truckload to go, a broccoli to go to market saying, can you haul my broccoli? If you do that, they're gonna charge you more because it's not a regular contract 
um, and, it's, uh, and it, it, it creates um, more management difficulties for them. They want full trucks. Again, you want to make the full use of that, of that asset. They want one-day runs if you can. So that means 200 miles in and 200 miles back. That's one day. They have um, hours of service limitations now. You cannot drive 14, 20-hour days like they used to in the olden days. Um, they're, uh, they're looking for one point of delivery. They do not want to go in with a 53-foot truck and deliver to six restaurants in your downtown city. They don't want that. That's crazy making. They lose major amounts of money because they're paid by the mile, not by the hour. Um, road congestion also creates um, headaches for them because of that paid by the mile, not by the hour problem. Um, and then they ha can, um, if, if you can divide up those trips between last mile delivery and over the road, they can get specific engineering to be less um, polluting um, and more uh, fuel efficient for them. So that also makes it possible for them to, to um, take on some new engineering. Then um, the wholesale buyers are looking for affordable cold storage space in Madison. Nobody has any cold storage space. Everybody's clamoring for it. We've got, um, they want one truck delivery to the buyer. Our um, university hospital wants to do all local food in the cafeteria. They've made immense progress, but they have one loading dock. So when they, and they have no storage space internally in that institution. So if they want um, local food, they need one truck delivery to come in and take, bring in every day what they need. And then the wholesale market it needs to be within 50 miles of major buyers because they're, again, paying that transportation cost. So they're looking for that. So transportation summary, we're looking for efficiency and diversity and the sweet spot between those two things. There are a lot of cri systemic critical thresholds that need to be met to make the system work and make it be profitable. I'm not going to read through all those. I think they're posting these online. That's the only reason I put the slide up there so you could quick see what they were. So I want to talk about food chain labor now. That was the other big issue, right? So um, food chain labor, I'm just going to talk about, oops, shoot, I always do that. I'm just going to talk about this right here. So there's labor throughout the supply chain. And just like the truckers having the same issues as the farmers, labor issues are also similar across the whole supply chain. So we've been looking at what is decent work? What is domestic fair trade? What does that mean? Um, is farming skilled or unskilled labor? Is labor organized or unorganized? And what's the role of public policy in all this mess? So I just want to bring home, this is something that's been discussed for a long time. This is a couple of kids in the 40s or 50s in Wisconsin Farmers Union who are saying farmer, farmers and laborers, laborers have a common um, mission here. And um, that's been you know, something that's been going on for a long time. It's not a new issue by any means. So FAO has been talking about decent work in agriculture and what does that mean? There are four pillars, full-time employment. That means seasonal labor is kind of a drag. It means people don't have work in the wintertime and if you're only doing labor, if you have no other means of supporting yourself than through your labor, that's not working so well for you. Um, um, uncertain work shifts, this applies to farmers as well as workers. You know, if you're working 12, 15 hour days, that's too long. That's too long for anybody. And to self-sweat, to own your own farm and make that decision to work that extra, extra amount of time during high labor needs, um, that's a, not a good thing. Um, social protection. Healthcare is a really big one. Most other countries have healthcare for all workers, especially workers who are in a really um, demanding, physically demanding job like agriculture. You need health insurance. Everybody needs that. Um, safe working conditions and protections at work. Um, this is about a fair wage for your labor, about enforcement of rules on um, labor rules on the farm. And then governance and social dialogue. Everybody needs a say in what happens in their workplace. That's, that's the bottom line. So that's, that's what the United Nations is telling us in agriculture. So we started to look at, oops, I got a weird numbering thing going on there. Um, we started to look at um, what does domestic fair trade mean? Um, can we find some examples that are working? And we came up with six. Um, um, Organic Valley and their supply chain partners is one. Uh, Fight for 15 campaigns is another. There's some really great stories there. 
um, CSA Vegetable Farms in the Upper Midwest. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, but Sarah Lloyd's going to talk about that at 4 p.m. track F. Um, she did that case study and will be giving us more information about that. Um, I will talk today about the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship, Milk with Dignity campaign, and good food procurement policies, and I will talk about it very fast. Uh, so we know that um, agriculture is considered low skill, and um, what we're seeing is a national um, wage about 10 bucks an hour in the Midwest, 11 bucks, Northeast, 990, so a little different, or 920, a little different there. Um, livestock workers make more. It uh, tends to be a year-round job. Um, they make better pay doing that work, um, and they have take on more hours in that, in that area. Crop workers make less, have fewer hours. Women get shafted, and he's surprised there. Um, and we're seeing um, other compensation. Um, we didn't look at um, to find out if there were other compensation, like housing or... Um, um, access to vehicles or things like that. So who determines that skill ladder? Who says that it's low skill? I mean, I don't think farming is low skill at all. Um, and so why is it considered low skill? Well, in, um, in, uh, in the skilled trades, they actually have, um, they develop a, a structure. Um, they have um, successful business operators, create a curriculum, um, the unions participate in setting standardized wages for, for workers who are out of the education system, fresh out and ready to go as farmers or as uh, workers. Apprentices make half the journey wage. So the journey wage, at least in electric electricians, plumbers, people like that, 30 bucks an hour is the starting wage for a journey. So if you're a beginning farmer, you're, a, um, you're just learning, 15 bucks an hour would be what you would get if you had a skill ladder developed. So there actually is a skill ladder being developed, and it's certified, a federally certified um, skill ladder. Um, the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship, um, let's see, Joe Tamandel, who started this program, is talking at 4 o'clock, track 6 today, um, and I'm sure he could tell you more about it. Um, it's amazing. It's really cool. And there are different groups that are also getting into this. CSAs are developing a curriculum and a skill ladder as well. Um, these are states that are involved at this point in the project, so it's going national. It started out in Wisconsin, going national. And uh, let's see. Jennifer Hashley is also talking Wednesday, track N, 1030. Um, and she runs this National Ag Apprenticeship Learning Network and we'll probably talk more about it there. Then uh, I wanted to mention really quickly about the Milk with Dignity case study. This is really cool because it gets really at that transparency issue. So Unilever is considered kind of a global aggregate, aggregated uh, company. They're the biggest food company in the world. Um, they own Ben & Jerry's. They signed this agreement with workers to improve working conditions and it's certified improvement over time. So. Even though they are a global company, there's transparency there that other, most other global com companies don't have. Then there is, um, let's see, I'm pretty sure there's somebody here talking about this too. Oh, maybe not. Um, so the Good Food Purchasing Program is another, another way to certify that the food coming into um, public institutions um, meets these criteria and improves over time. And there are a number of cities, cities working on this. Um, LA was the first to develop and adopt this, um, but Minneapolis is doing it, Chicago's doing it, I think Boston's doing it. There are lots of cities that are engaged in this particular thing, and we'll have a whole case study on that. Um, so I want to get back to that, that point I made very in the very beginning, that it's about community. It's about having relationships with people who can help each other to make the food system work. This guy is a crop consultant with, working with a farmer on apples. And there has to be enough apple growers for that crop consultant to be able to um, do this work. If he doesn't have enough business, he can't do that work. So there's a critical threshold of number of farmers that has to be met. Um, these farmers are getting together to talk about what's working, what's not working in their apple orchards. That kind of convening and sharing of knowledge is really important. Farmer networks are critical for that, that sharing. 
Um, this is a meeting at the Chicago Metropolitan Agency of Planning to talk about how to get local food into Chicago because the pipelines are enormous going into Chicago and nobody from Wisconsin can access those pipelines. So this was uh, being able to participate in meetings like this and to think about how to make it work is really important. Uh, Wisconsin Food Hub Co-op, Sarah Lloyd's um, um, heading that up. She's the one talking at 4 p.m. today, track F. Um, a whole lot of farmers are gathering together to make, to pull enough product together to get on a 53-foot truck. Now the truck needs somewhere to go. This is somewhere to go. The Ontario Food Terminal is considered the best food terminal in North America. All the food terminals want to know how they're doing what they're doing. And one of the things they're doing is they're making sure these guys, these three guys in particular, are making sure that very small supply chains, a farmer with one truck or somebody with a van and a bunch of uh, vegetable starts can go sell that product to somebody in a wholesale supply chain. So I want to talk about this really quickly because this is getting back at what we were talking about earlier. This is, this is the model that we've been working on. Environmentally sound, socially acceptable, um, economically viable. And what we're talking about and what I heard, um, does any, has anyone heard Denisa Livingston from the Navajo Nation speak yet? You got to put her, take her name down. Denisa uh, Livingston, Navajo, Dine. She is amazing. She helped me understand that what we need to be doing is taking a slight turn and looking at what is equal regionally appropriate, what promotes community, social justice, and what is healthy maybe is a better measure than what is, what is economically viable. So thinking about health as a key, what we're really after. We're really after being healthy as a, as a nation, as, a, as our, um, our rural or urban community. Yep, go ahead. Sure, it's Denisa, I think it's D-E-N-I-S-A, um, Livingston, kind of the normal spelling for Livingston. Um, she's heading up the Turtle Island um, Slow Food Unit, so she's maybe late 20s, early 30s, amazing. So I want to challenge you to think about this as healthy, substituting healthy for economically viable and see how that changes your thinking about your work. And I think that's my last slide. Yep, that's my last slide. Thank you.